in the world is happening on Wall Street. Economic indicators. Who knows where this is going to end up? To understand the economy, you have to understand human nature. This podcast is powered by Acast. How are you doing there? It's David. It's podcast time. You know the drill. We're trying to make the economy that little bit more comprehensible, that little bit more accessible, and hopefully a little bit more meaningful for all of our lives. Now, the last three months have been extraordinary. Nobody, and I mean nobody, forecast the pandemic and what it has done to us, to our lives, to the economy. Later on, we're going to be talking about these black swan events, how they change the world, how they add complexity to the world, and how they are something that we just have to kind of deal with. But this is a massive black swan event. A black swan event is an event with low probability, or extremely low probability, but extremely high impact. So we're going to talk about that later on. But I have down the line, because we're apart, because he's out of town for the weekend. My man, Mr. Davis, how are you, Head? I am very good. I had a black pint event last night. <laughs> Where were you? I uh, just uh, went down to, to a bar. It was, it was actually myself and Sheena's first night out in four months. And it was like breaking the fast. Wow, it was great. Breaking the fast. It is a bit like Lent, isn't it? Yeah. Come here to me. I was sent a meme, which is incredibly apt from the 17th century by a guy called, you know, Samuel Pepys? Oh, I do. One of the great diarists of all time, John. One of the great diarists of was all he? time. Was that what he was? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, was, he, was a, he was an English geezer, a diarist, who actually more or less gave chapter and verse about lots of events that happened in London in what they called the Glorious Revolution, which was between William of Orange yeah. taking over the throne, which was a Dutch takeover of England leading to huge financial and economic and trade expansion and culminating, culminating actually in the uh, South Sea bubble that we talked about in yeah. about 1720. So Peeps was an interesting... What did he say? Tell me what he said. Here's the, here's the quote now. The taverns are full of gadabouts making merry this eve. And though I may press my face against the window like an urchin at a confectioner's, I am tempted not by the sweetmeats within. A dram in exchange for the pox is an ill bargain indeed. Samuel oh, Pepys, that's... Great Plague, 1665. That see, nothing has changed. <laughs> that is a thing of beauty. A dram in exchange for the pox. <laughs> that is fantastic. Well, it's interesting you talk about the bars then. A tweet the other day I saw was from Luke O'Neill, yeah. which was a Texas medical association. The highest risk on a scale of 1 to 10 of catching COVID in the United States right now, is going to a bar. The lowest risk of saying, opening the mail, pumping gas, playing tennis, right. or going camping. But the highest risk, <laughs> the absolute highest risk, is going to a bar. So there you have it. Samuel Pepys and yourself, not wrong in the great plague of London. Yeah. I'm not wrong now. So, Mac, listen, I'll spare you my regular Trump rant, and I'll let you kick off today. What have you been reading? What's rocking your world? Many things, John. Many, many issues. I have been reading in depth about the role of the bond market in financing William of Orange. And the Battle of the Boyne was financed by incredible monetary innovation coming out of Amsterdam. So we'll talk about that next week. But this week, you know what I want to talk about, John? I was reading the programme for government again. And do you remember last week we touched on this idea of job creation? This thing that... Yeah politicians always talk about. And it has actually yeah. no bearing at all in economics, the notion of job creation. So I decided I was going to go through, this is how, how much I do for you, John, how much I do for you. I go through the programme of government <laughs> right. looking for references to job creation, right? Yeah. There, and I found 14 specific references to job creation all over yeah. the programme for government is this idea of job creation. As we touched on yep. last week. Sounds good. Sounds great. But nobody goes out of their way or starts a company to employ people. What you do is you try and start a company to sell a product. If that product is successful, if people want to buy your product, then you think, okay, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to employ more people. The only place sure. where job creation comes first, John, and maybe this is revelatory, 
is in the public administration, but in the real world of the private sector, where between 85% and 88% of Irish people are employed, what actually happens yeah. is it happens the other way around, that the job yeah, isn't yeah. created. The job is what follows on from a successful product launch. That is critical. And sure. therefore, John, yeah, yeah, yeah. people who write about job creation have no idea of how the process actually begins, which gives me great trepidation when I hear it, because it means that it's been written by bureaucrats, civil servants, and political advisors and politicians who've never actually created a job. Why? Because they don't understand what the process is. I get completely where you're coming from, Mark, but when they talk about job creation, are they not talking about creating the environment for people to create products in order to create jobs? Well, if they were, they should be a little bit more explicit because, again, what that comes down to, John, is it presupposes that you can forecast the future. And one of the attributes, one of the characteristics of it is that nobody can predict the future. So if you come back to the idea of the entrepreneur trying to figure out we're going to launch a new product. We're going to see, does this yeah. product work? We're going to tinker around the margins. We're going to trial it. We're going to spend a huge amount of money and effort and time in trying to figure out, will this work in the market? This is the same, John, whether you're running a multinational or a small cafe. You open your doors. But you need a certain amount of forecasting, though. But this, again, is the interesting thing, is that no amount of forecasting can actually underwrite something, can guarantee something, can most sure. businesses yeah, yeah, fail, yeah. most ideas fail. You know, man Clausewitz, the military historian, says, no general's plans survive the first collision with the enemy. It's also better put by Mike Tyson, the great American boxer and economist and philosopher, <laughs> which was everybody has a plan until they get a punch in the face, Right. So the best, you <laughs> yeah, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a great quote. In actual fact, it's one of the greatest economics quotes ever, right? So it's the same for products, it's the same for the economy, that nobody can actually forecast what's going on. I'll give you a good example, John. When we were kids, do you remember Guinness Light? Yes, I do, actually. It was well, you remember utter you, muck. You, well, I, I think we were probably too young. We were probably too young to know whether it was utter muck. But... Yeah. Guinness Light was introduced by Guinness, I think, in the late 1970s. The reason I can remember is my granny had a pub in Cork and the local farmers just gave a big no-no yeah. to yeah. Guinness Light. But I remember it being an enormous product launch. It was all over RTE, all over the radio. In terms of trying to minimise the risk of the product, you probably couldn't have minimised the risk. But again, it collapsed. And the interesting thing is, it wasn't that the product was wrong. Guinness Light, it was just wrong at that time because right. in subsequent yeah. decades, all sorts of booze companies are trying to introduce lighter booze, lower alcohol booze, less calorie booze, the stuff that JM works on, that white claw stuff. Have you heard about that? Yes, I have. It's actually really good. Just think about Guinness Light, John, right? It was the best laid plan. They had the most meticulous research they had done their market research. They had figured out who was drinking it, who was going to drink it. They'd done the demographics. They'd done the income, all these things. And yet it failed. Mm. Why? Because you can never, ever, ever forecast the economy. And why is this? It's because the economy is a complex organism. The economy is not like some hydraulic machine that goes from one equilibrium point to another, the way economists think about it. So economists yeah, are obsessed yeah. by equilibrium. And equilibrium is this point where in economics, the definition of equilibrium is there is no tendency to change. But that's not how the economy works. The economy is changing yeah. all the time. This sort of Schumpterian idea, it's always changing. It's like this. Yeah, it's like that idea that we talked about. It's like a, an ecosystem. It's exactly, it's like, a, it's like an environmental ecosystem, right? So if you yeah. examine an ecosystem, so you know the way, for example, they say in environmental uh, studies, you know, in the rainforest, if you cut down a large tree, the ramifications for tiny little trees and little tributaries and little animals and further down the food chain is phenomenal, yeah. right? Because everything yeah. is interrelated. Yeah. Everything is incredibly complex, right? 
So if you look, right, yeah. if you look at the economy, it works in exactly the same way. The beautiful thing about the economy, John, is nobody is in charge. This is what I love. It's a design without a designer. So there's nobody pulling levers because if there were people pulling levers, A, you could create jobs and B, you could create products that you could kind of bet would succeed, right? But they don't yeah. happen. And the only system that tried to actually orchestrate from the very top down was the Soviet system. And we know that that fails spectacularly. So basically, the modern economy that we look at and we live in and that we introduce products to is this bottom-up, incredibly sensitive ecosystem. And even if you go, I mean, just to take a, a sense of the complexity of the economy, if you go into a supermarket, like if you go into Dunn's now, John, and you look at how many products there are on the shelf for the same thing. Yeah. And that sort of complexity is something that politicians don't seem to grasp, that that complexity is coming from the bottom up. Nobody knows why things fail. Nobody knows why they succeed. If we yeah. did, we'd all be millionaires because every product launched would actually be successful. Then to come back to job creation, John, the job comes after the success of the product, not before. So jobs and unemployment are a consequence of this healthy ecosystem where everyone's buying and selling, launching, figuring things out, trying to forecast, etc. But nobody's got any sense of what's going to work. And this is the very essence of the entrepreneurial economy that we live in. It's the very essence of the Schumpterian idea that the creative destruction is going on all around us. It's that classic quote of, you know, 50% of the advertising budget works. I'm just not sure which 50%. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So then you think, so what we're dealing with is an economy that is a complex system, but it's also a complex adaptive system so that every person, every product in the economy is adapting all the time to signals it's getting from the market. So in a way, it's like, we come back to this idea of evolution, John. But basically, evolution is like an algorithm. You go through all these options and eventually one version, one design of the plant or the species is the one that adapts properly. And then that adaptive design is the one that gets reproduced. And it's not really survival of the fittest. In fact, Darwin never said survival of the fittest. It's survival of the most adaptable. And it's exactly right. the same in the modern economy. The most adaptive product and entrepreneur is the one that tends to actually win. But you've no yeah. idea before you go into it whether you're going to win or not, which is why, for example, to come back to the Guinness light idea, is the past success of Guinness was no guarantee of the future success of Guinness light. Because even if they were the best people working in it and the people who understood the system, they still couldn't figure out what this bottom-up market was trying to do. And this makes the ecosystem unbelievably prone to these black swan events. And I don't mean prone in the sense that they'll happen a lot, John, but when they do happen, like the pandemic, the implication yeah. is enormous. So just explain to me these black swan events. This comes from Nassim Taleb, doesn't it? It comes from my old mate, Nassim. Yes, my old grumpy mate, Nassim, right? <laughs> grumpy Nassim. But Nassim... Talib's black swan, the main argument was the world is incredibly complicated and nobody can forecast with any real accuracy what's going to happen. So nobody knows the future. So therefore, you yeah. have to become what he would describe as anti-fragile, the opposite of fragile. So you have to try and be, this is a really interesting idea, that if an unexpected event happens, there's three types mm -hmm. of people and institutions there's people who get knocked over by unexpected events. There's people yeah. who just about survive unexpected events. And there's people who thrive in unexpected events. They thrive in random okay. randomness, right? They build an infrastructure around them. And the same for companies and organizations. And one of the reasons that complexity amplifies the impact is that when everything is interconnected, like the banking system, John, if you have a shock in a small place, like do you remember the subprime shock in 2008, yeah, 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 2007? Yeah, yeah. So it's a small yeah. shock in Texas and Alabama and those places. In short order, Lehman goes bust and the world's financial system collapses. So that's the complexity. Everything's interrelated. 
So a small event yeah. that happens, which is a low probability event in one area, has this amplified impact all over the world. It's similar to the, the flap of the butterfly wing in Europe causing a hurricane in the States or whatever. That, you know. that sort of idea. Yeah. So what he's saying is that in a complex system, you will have these black swan events. These yeah. black swan events create their own internal dynamic. As our economy becomes more interdependent and more complex, to go back to our original point about job creation, it's only the companies and the individuals that build up this resilience or almost this ability to thrive in adversity that can actually consistently grow in an uncertain or random world. Which is why when a bureaucrat sits down, John, to write, we are going to create 2,000 jobs or 300,000 jobs, it's all bullshit. Because you can't, yeah. you can't forecast it. Now, the, the final thing, of course, John, is that on these events, you superimpose, therefore, technology. And technological change is happening so quickly now that it is leading to the obsolescence of products and companies at a rate we've never seen before. If you think, you know, I've been doing a lot of economic history the last while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, for example, let's, let's go back to the first technologies, the wheel or flint or sharp objects or any of those sort of things, right? For thousands of years, there was very little technological progress in the world. Up until about 1000 AD, what you see, John, is the arrival of big Gothic cathedrals all around Europe. You know, these huge cathedrals, they were all built from about 1000 yeah, yeah, AD yeah, yeah. to about 1200 AD. Now, that suggest there was massive, massive innovation. What was actually happening was the plough was the most innovative technology introduced in Europe in thousands of years, the heavy plough. The heavy iron plough that was necessary to plough the very damp soil of northwestern Europe only came in around right. 1000 AD. Prior okay. to that, they had the Egyptian plough, which was only good at ploughing up very, very, very dry soil in the Mediterranean, the Fertile Crescent. Right. Okay? But the heavy plough allows Europeans in the northwest to dig up the land, to plough land that was previous to this unploughable, and that increases agricultural yields. And what do you get? You get something bizarre like the cathedrals. The cathedrals are the architectural legacy of the plough. It's a fascinating stuff. Yeah, it's brilliant. It is. But then, again, then, then you go up into the Renaissance and all that change. With, then you get to the 19th century and more technological change happens in the 19th century than happened in the previous nine centuries. And then you get into the yeah. 20th century and more technological change happened in the first three decades of the 20th century than happened in the whole 19th century. And then you get to our era and technological changes profoundly changed everything. So I'll give you the, the, the good example, which was in Tom Friedman's book about the Volkswagen, right? Yes. Where he said a 1971 Volkswagen Beetle to undergo the same transformation as we've seen in computer programming, in computer dynamics. He said yeah. that Beetle would now travel at 300,000 miles an hour and it would achieve <laughs> 2 million miles per gallon of petrol <laughs> and it would cost just 4 cents. So think about it. If you were to put in the same exponential, the Moore's law, you know, in, in computer programming, the That's same right. yeah, yeah. level law, yeah. of speed of technology, right? So you take that, you superimpose that on the complex system we're talking about, and what you have is a recipe for hyper change that no bureaucrat or no politician can ever forecast. And that's why... I thought that was your job as an economist. No, 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 no. Well, I mean, that's the, that's the thing. You know, economists can only... You know, what, what economists can do, though, and that's true, is you can actually forecast, or at least you can warn people about monetary events. There's no doubt of that. Yeah. But in terms of being able to pinpoint exactly where and when the change is going to happen, nobody can do that. Now, the interesting the difference yeah. between the economist and the investor is the following. The economist's job, I think the public economist's, job or the public commentator's job is to warn people in advance that an event will happen. The difference between an economist and an investor, an investor's job is to actually gamble as to when exactly that will happen and how much that will shift the market. Right. So they're two quite different. Okay. And if you go back to Taleb, Taleb's big idea is that nobody can forecast the future. So what you've got to do is you've got to set up your whole world and your whole life being as 
anti-fragile as possible. This is what he talks in the game. This is why, for example, when I remember I told you when he said he would do Kilkenomics with us, he said, have you got a job? Yeah. I said, no. He said, Grant, I'll do it then, right? Because his idea was you're <laughs> anti-fragile. You're actually, you know, you're making shit up and you're, and you're, you're living day to day yeah. and seeing what yeah, works yeah, yeah. and whatnot. But to come back to my point about job creation. But isn't that the politician's job, though, that they're trying to create an environment that is anti-fragile? Yes. Well, I think that they should be much more honest about what they can and cannot do. And they should say, OK, look, we know that it's a complicated world. We know that you cannot create jobs. You've got to create products. And those products, if they're successful, the jobs flow from that. And so too do profits. Mm. And so too does wealth. Because at the end of the day, you want to create an environment where more people can become more wealthy than the previous. That's the whole objective. And then from where wealth flows, good standards of living, good education systems, you know, all those sort of things. They flow from being wealthy. So that's what I noticed about yeah. Cuba. The slogans in Cuba are great. But the problem is, unless you create the wealth, the slogans can't deliver anything, right? So you have to create the wealth in order to figure out what you do with it. And the way in which you create mm. wealth is you appreciate that we're talking about an economy that evolves and the evolution is basically the work of entrepreneurs trying to figure stuff out. And then, of course, the state helping them, helping them through the education system. And then you're right about grants and all that sort of stuff. And what we were talking about, helicopter yeah. money, all that sort of stuff helps people. But at the very core, you need to leave these people do their own thing. And you also have to appreciate that failure is part of life. And the problem, I think, with politicians is that they're always trying to suggest that success is something that we can frame. And we really can't. And I can understand why they do it, because obviously, if they can link a job to a vote to them, then, of course, what they do is they create this narrative that in some way they are profoundly important. Now, in the extreme, they are. And if you can destroy an economy with really bad policies, Zimbabwe being a great example, Venezuela yeah. being a great example, yeah. the Soviet Union being a great example. I mean, you can actually destroy something. But in the, in the mainstream middle where we are, it seems to me that the politicians are only, they're only sizing themselves up for a fall if they go on about job creation. But what should a government do? Because on one hand, they do need to be positive and to promise their constituents some sort of light at the end of the tunnel and a prosperous future. So if they're not offering a job creation program, how else should they go about it? How else should they communicate that? I think what they should do, John, is to be very honest with themselves about how much the state can actually do. So, for example, at the moment, what I would think is that what the state could do is they, we know the state can borrow at yeah. zero interest rates. That means you can fix lots of things. So, for example, I still believe that small businesses in Ireland who have been hit by this pandemic are going to be in a really vicious credit crunch in the course of the next year or two. And I think the way you fix that is you give them money. A credit crunch only happens when people are worried about other people not paying. Yeah. And therefore, the source of the worry is the anxiety that people, your creditors, your suppliers, your debtors don't have money. So I think that the cost to society of a collapse in small business is far greater than the cost to society of raising money at 0.0% or 0.2%. So we know the cost right. is almost zero. It's almost negligible. So it strikes me that that is what we should do, which is giving small businesses the latitude they have to begin the process of creating great products. That's my sense. And rather than therefore talking about how they are going to actively create jobs, you say, look, we're not going to create anything, but we're going to give you guys the latitude to do what you guys do best, which is create products. And then off right. we go into what I would call the great adventure, John, of the commercial odyssey in life. Ooh. The, the great Irish economist Richard Cantillon from the early 18th century said, the difference between the entrepreneur and the worker is the worker works for a fixed wage. He sells yeah. his labor to somebody for a fixed wage. The entrepreneur yeah, yeah. buys something at a known price and sells it at an unknown price. 
And that's the risk, right? So you buy something right. here, and then you've no idea are you going to sell it for a higher price or a lower price. And selling it for a higher price means that you've got to ensure that you add value added along the way, the product works, and away you go. And that's what I think we need to understand is that it's those decisions that drive the economy. Tiny, tiny decisions taken by loads and loads of individuals every day. That's what drives the economy. That's the bottom-up ecosystem that we talk about. And what we've got to do is reward that ecosystem and not just reward it, but also, John, kind of celebrate it and don't denigrate yeah. it. Because, you know, it's so easy to, to, to take the piss out of people for trying and so easy to be cynical and to denigrate the effort and the ambition. But the wonderful yeah. thing is to see the ambition come to fruition. And that's what the state should be all about. Now, over the last couple of weeks, we're all aware of the Black Lives Matters campaign in the United States. This is focusing on history and slavery and race relations and all these issues that were largely swept under the carpet. People wanted to forget. They want to pretend things weren't happening. Now, down in the Caribbean this week, something very interesting has been happening. My old mate, and as I have said before, one of the finest economists on this earth, Marla Dukaran, has been on Jamaican radio discussing something which I think for us Europeans and us Irish people is incredibly important. And she's written a piece called J'accuse, which means obviously I accuse, the European Union's institutionalized racism and bullying. Marla, how are you? This is quite the, uh, this is quite the tome, and it's, it's a very interesting read for us Europeans who aren't really aware How's life, number one? And explain to me what's going on. Hi, David. And thanks for highlighting the report that I've put out. But the first thing I want to say is this piece was clearly not just my work. And so I just it, want to also thank Damien Edgel. He's a lawyer for his contribution. Now, it really is based on the fact that I, and I've written on this before, a year ago, that you know, the small countries in the Caribbean, as well as other parts of the world and in the Pacific and, and elsewhere, you know, we are not treated fairly. Basically, we are just not treated fairly by the European Union. And, and I outline the reasons why I feel this way and my justifications for this accusation in that piece. So explain to me why you feel, and also I'd like to say to listeners, I've known Marla a long time. This is somebody who's much more of a numbers-based economist, much more of a granular economist. It's unusual for you to suggest this. Explain to me what you think is going on, why the European Union is not treating countries fairly, and why you've also said that basically all the countries that are being unfairly treated are majority black countries. Are not, not majority, majority white black, countries. not majority black, majority non-white. So you have Arab countries, Pacific countries as well. So not just black, so majority non-white countries. Okay, so explain to me, explain what, what, what's going on. Well, let's start with that, just to put it on the table. There are two lists that the European Union publishes. One is a blacklist where they highlight countries that are low tax jurisdictions that they are not pleased with in terms of their tax policy. And the second is a list of so-called high-risk third countries that they believe represent anti-money laundering and, and terrorist financing risks. So there are two lists, right? And I feel like there is no coincidence. It has to be a massive statistical anomaly, David, that not a single country on either of those lists is a predominantly white country, right? So let's deal with tax first. Ireland is one of the lowest tax jurisdictions in the world, right? Certainly it is one of the lowest tax jurisdictions in the EU alongside Hungary, okay? You have the Isle of Man, Guernsey, you have all kinds of other low tax jurisdictions that are predominantly white within the EU and without that do not appear on this list. 
Marla, let me stop you there. So tell me what the blacklist is. Tell me exactly what it is and what it means. So this blacklist related to tax, as published by the European Union, is a list of countries that they have basically said have harmful tax practices. Now, in the first place, they are not the world's international authority on tax matters. The OECD is recognized as the global tax policy authority. And therefore, countries that have signed on to the OECD's international tax policy have to follow certain guidelines. The, the OECD does assessments and the OECD comes up with lists of who are compliant, partially compliant, non-compliant, working towards compliance, et cetera, et cetera. And that is the global recognized authority and list. And one morning, the EU woke up and decided, we don't like that list. We want our own list. And guess what? Our member states are not subject to the methodology of assessment that we have unilaterally come up with and we have unilaterally enforced on other jurisdictions outside of the EU who have decided and that, that they want to be a low tax jurisdiction. So for example, Barbados, Bahamas, Bermuda, Cayman Islands, just to name a few in this region, BVI, we have a sovereign right, just like Ireland does, to decide what our domestic corporate tax policy looks like. And we are working with the OECD to make sure that we do not have harmful tax practices. And many of us have passed all kinds of legislative amendments to be compliant with the OECD. And many of us have been adjudicated by the OECD to be compliant or at least almost fully compliant. The EU, however, chooses to impose higher restrictions and standards on us, but not so on its own members. Not so on its own members, and also not so on any country that is predominantly white, because no predominantly white country is on the blacklist. So tell me, Marla, you as a person of color feel that this is informed by a form of race. So I want to reframe the whole thing in one second. It's discrimination, okay, it's whether racial or otherwise. Because why is Delaware not on the list? Why are none of the U.S. jurisdictions not on the list? Why are none of the, um, the predominantly white British jurisdictions not on the list? Only the British jurisdictions that are not white are on the list, like Cayman Islands and Bermuda. Well, I'm going to just reframe this before I answer that question, because basically a country like Ireland 40 years ago, what happens in economics when you have no capital? If you're a poor, small country, you have to figure out, OK, we have no capital. How do we attract capital in here in order to fuse that capital with our people to create new products and services and to grow the bloody economy, to create wealth? So what we did in Ireland is we're going to make capital cheap by cutting the tax on it. Capital flows in here. So our model has been almost directly cut and paste by many countries now in the Caribbean or similar type models. And what you're saying is we were allowed to do that and you guys are not. Exactly. And the thing is, I have, I have no beef with, with the Irish, you know, no pun intended, <laughs> for doing this. You, you are well within your sovereign right to do this and to organize your domestic economy and your domestic affairs in a manner in which you think is best for you. But then everybody else should be allowed to do the same because you're not, you're not harming anybody else in the process except that the EU takes this as, a, as, as an affront because it affects their own competitiveness. Now explain to me what the blacklist means in reality to a small island nation and are one of the small Central American nations like Belize, for example. What does it mean in reality? What does it mean for us? Well, in the first place, when you are placed on this blacklist, any jurisdiction within the EU that does business with you, so for example, let's say you're a, a French producer of butter and you're exporting to Belize or you're exporting to Barbados and your bankers realize that you're doing business with this country that is on a blacklist or on a list of so-called high-risk third countries, they are obligated by the EU to conduct enhanced due diligence on that entity in the EU, right? On that exporter of butter. 
And it costs more money for this due diligence to be conducted because you have to pay accountants and lawyers and the banks take long to make your transactions to bring that money back to you to get paid. They, 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 they want to ask for all kinds of extra information. It takes longer, it costs money. It makes doing business with these small jurisdictions much more difficult. And therefore, the exporter of butter in the EU is likely to, or anywhere else for that matter, is likely to say, man, why am I bothering to do business with this small country that's really half a container of, of butter every month? I could just forget about them and do business with Brazil, do business with Argentina, do business with some country in Africa or in Asia, and, and not bother with these small countries. And so it puts at a, us as, at a disadvantage because the cost of doing business, the cost of importing, the cost of transaction, international transactions, wire transfers, all of the costs of all of these things are then therefore higher for us. And that makes us poorer, that makes us less competitive, and that makes us severely disadvantaged. And we are already struggling, David, with climate change. We're already struggling with smallness and the diseconomies of scale that go with smallness. And by the way, all of us on the blacklist put together are like 1% of GDP of the whole world, and we compare very, very insignificantly with the EU. And so what they're doing is also disproportionate. Like if you completely eliminate all of us, it would make no difference to all of you. You know, if we were all wiped off the face of the earth, you would not feel a thing, except maybe you wouldn't be able to come on holidays and smoke as much ganja here. But the point is, we are not significant. So why put all of this pressure on us? So why do you think? Well, David, it's kind of hard for me to not conclude even partially that this has colonial roots and underpinnings and racial roots and underpinnings. Because also every single country on this blacklist and on this list of high-risk third countries has in one way or another been colonized or occupied by Europeans in, in the past. Every single country. I can't help but think that this is part of the motivation. And then let's go a little bit deeper into this because, you know, Irish people, not in the same issue, not in the same extent, but have an understanding of the legacy of colonialism. There's no doubt of that. And what you think, what you think is that it's, it's, it's Dutch, it's British, it's French, it's the big powers, the Spaniards, basically saying those natives that we used to lord it over are getting all uppity now with their new tax systems. They're trying to take money from us. And frankly, it's not only that they shouldn't do this, but they shouldn't even be allowed because we should still have a say over them because we once were the top dogs. Mm -hmm. Exactly. We are not being given a chance to compete on a level playing field. And the other thing I want to add, including the disproportionate nature of their action and the fact that it's arbitrary in the sense that it's unilaterally imposed on us. Who is the biggest money launderer in the world, David? You tell me. I'd say London, probably. London and Russia, probably, and the Kingdom of the Netherlands. They don't ever appear on this list. Who are the biggest financiers of terrorism, David, in this, in, in, globally? Saudi Arabia. Thank you. <laughs> and, and Venezuela, Colombia, you know, a lot of, of, of dirty money passes through Venezuela. None of them are on this list. Venezuela has the number one reserves of oil in the world. That's why they're not on the list. The thing is, we are being marginalized, not just because of the policies we choose to implement that are competitive to the EU, but because it is as though we do not have a right to try to do what you guys have done. We are forever supposed to be subjugated. We are forever supposed to be dominated. And finally, the other thing that I have a real issue with in terms of the way that we are treated is that whenever the EU says, listen, here's my standard, here's my methodology, you need to comply with this to get off the blacklist. And then we spend lots of money and time making all kinds of legislative amendments to get off the blacklist. And then you know what? 
a year or two later. It happened in 2018 and now it's happening again in 2020. They change their methodology. They change their standards and their requirements. They blacklist us again two years later and say, well, no, we've decided to change the way that we do this. And so now you have to pass new amendments to your legislation. You have to introduce new legislation and you have to comply yet again. Otherwise, we're putting you back. So the goalpost keeps changing. And again, you in Ireland are not required to comply with what we are required to comply with, which keeps changing every couple of years. How is that fair? And finally, the last thing I want to say about that demonstrates how unfair this is, is that there is no known recourse. Could you imagine being accused of something, being held to a standard, and there is nobody that you can complain to and say, I think I'm being treated unfairly. There is nobody. There is so no, no international court, there's body. No court, there's no there is none. There's I've, no I've, sp I've spoken to people at the UN, and I know that one of the prime ministers in this region has appealed at the level of the United Nations General Assembly. In my article, I appeal to the EU and I appeal to the UN. The UN may be the only body that we have, that we can or we could try to appeal to, right? But there is no formal, standardized, recognized body that we can appeal to for these complaints because the EU is so powerful. So in your article, and it's funny, you, Marla, I've known you for a long time. I've never heard you sound so pissed off. I've never heard you sound so angry. So you talk about bullying, and it's very, very clear from what you're saying that when you're 1% of GDP, you're bullied, you're pushed around. You're talking about racism because there's no coincidence in your, and it seems pretty straightforward that every single country on the blacklist happens to be majority non-white. Against the background of Black Lives Matter, against the issue of racism becoming again a focus, does it kind of annoy you that these are platitudes the EU talks about all the time? Oh my God, we did these horrible things in the past. We, how do we do these things? We we'll tear down a few statues and we try to rectify things. And yet, we in the EU are still imposing on you guys sort of neo-colonial terms of trade. Yes, it is very unfair. And I can't help but think, and I've mentioned this in the report as well, I can't help but think that this is just another manifestation of a really deep, I suppose, unshakable predisposition of Europeans to dominate and marginalize the weak and poorer countries. When you look at what France did to Haiti, making Haiti basically repay them for all of the slaves and for all of the losses of, of sugar revenue, for how many years until Haiti has become still the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, the only country to have ever liberalized itself from colonial rule via violent means. I can't help but think that that economic warfare that was waged on Haiti is the same economic warfare that's being waged on us, simply because Military warfare is no longer acceptable, socially acceptable, and it's also, uh, you know, we, we have no defense. So military warfare is not, not, not the way to do things anymore. So, we, so you wage economic warfare on us and, and engage in a smear campaign by calling us, I mean, really, David, how ridiculous is that that you call this list a blacklist? Come on, the OECD does not even use that language. They use compliant, fully compliant, partially compliant, et cetera, et cetera. The EU, however, in revealing its true nature and disposition, calls this list a black list. And then they have a gray list. I mean, it really, they really reveal themselves in a, in a meaningful and embarrassing way. And I feel like this is a manifestation of what their, their true nature is. And I, I regret that we have not, as a region in the Caribbean, come out forcefully, collectively, to denounce what the, the EU has done. There has been a few public communiques that went out from CARICOM, but 
honestly, I feel also we need to take some blame for this because we have not acted in a, in a coordinated and cohesive manner as a region to come out. Small countries have not done enough to come out and, and, and denounce and resist this as well. Perhaps because we are intimidated, we are insecure, and we feel we have no recourse, we have nobody to complain to, we feel nobody supports us, but still we should resist. I, I, and, but I regret to say we haven't done enough of that as well. So we have some blame to shoulder for this. Well, Marla, this is, you know, we've talked about this before, and the only thing I can promise you is there's 100,000 people listen to this podcast every week. And this will come, this will come as huge, a lot of news to us because in a way we have allowed ourselves to think, oh, well, we're doing development work and we're doing development aid and et cetera, et cetera. So the European Union's on the on the side of the angels. I know that sounds ridiculous for you to yes, think. Yes, but right? once you're on these lists, you are not entitled to any aid or any technical assistance from the EU. None. Wow. That's one of the other consequences. Yeah. Once you're on either of these lists, you are not entitled to any financial or technical assistance from the EU. Okay, Marla, where can we see this report? Where can listeners go to see this? And let's, let's talk about this again. Yeah, it's on my blog on Medium. It's also on my website, maladukaran.com, M-A-R-L-A-D-U-K-H-A-R-A-N.com. And it's also on my Twitter feed as well. You can just look it up on Twitter. It's on my pinned tweet. So it's, Listen, it's easy to access. Let's, let's try and tell the world about this because it's something that most Europeans, I really deeply believe, don't know or have never thought about or it's never come across their page. Why? Because the powers that be don't want it to come across their page. No, so, and I appreciate, David, what you've done in helping to highlight this. I know the Irish are the closest to us of any of the European countries because like, like us, you were, col you were colonized before we were, right? And subjugated before we were. And you guys were the first slaves in the Caribbean. So you and I, we have, we have solidarity with you and I appreciate your solid solidarity with us. And I appreciate the support that we get from, from you. And I, I really appreciate your trying to highlight this issue. It really is just unfair. It really is unfair. And I think there's no place for this level of, of subjugation in this world anymore. Marla, listen, as always, fascinating to talk to you. Let's follow this up. Let's not leave this one. Let's keep, keep going and keep shouting and telling people about it. Thank you so much, David. Take care. Talk to you soon. John, that was, uh, that's incredibly powerful from Marla there. Not least because, I mean, I've known her for a long time. I've never heard her so angry and so definitive in what she's saying that, yeah. that you guys, you know, it's very easy for us in Ireland to say, oh, it's all Donald Trump and it's all these Americans and Black Lives Matter is, is an issue for the Americans or the British. But she's pointing the finger at us and saying, you guys are involved in this too. Yeah, she certainly was pissed off. It's fascinating, and it's something that I, I'm completely unaware of. In fairness, I'd say that most people across Europe well, I, are, are the same. What she's basically saying is there is money laundering. There is a problem with tax jurisdictions. But you guys in Ireland yeah. have used this, the tax, for years. The biggest money launderers are the city of London. Nobody talks about them. Russia's the biggest London. Nobody talks about them. The biggest financer of terrorism is Saudi Arabia, but because they've got oil, they've got power. Yeah. In the context of Russia and Britain, she's saying, and they're white. Nobody comes after them. But when you're small and you're black and you're in the Caribbean and you're trying to do your best because you're small, because you were a colonial occupied country, because the legacy of colonialism is so deep there that we Europeans, white Europeans, don't even give them a chance. It's, it's, it's extraordinary stuff, John. Yeah. It's a whole new dimension to the Black Lives Matter movement, actually, and therefore very, very timely. I'll tell you what we should do. Let's keep this campaign going. Let's tell as many people as possible. Yep. Let's put Marla yep. back on. And maybe let's like ask the EU to answer a few of those uh, those accusations.
Yeah, let's go follow up. All right, dude. I'll talk to you next week. Cheers, Good luck. Bye. How are you doing there? It's David. Now, the whole objective of the podcast, as you know, has been to share economics, learn economics, make it easier, make it more accessible, make it more relevant. And in that regard, what we've done is we introduced a couple of months ago the macroeconomic course. Now we're introducing a new idea. It's going to be called Ask Mac. And what it is, it's a tutorial. But the difference is it's a tutorial designed and delivered and executed by you. You pick the topics. We then give you a tutorial every fortnight on that topic. The first topic is the bond market because we were inundated with your questions about the bond market, how it works, etc. Have a listen to it. The first one is free. And if you like it, sign up and join us on patreon.com. David McWilliams for the Ask Mac tutorial.